happy to be able to call a friend as well. So I first learned of Erin's work with the, some of the things that she was doing with Carolyn Musselwhite, which she continues to do with Carolyn Musselwhite, and most particularly her work um, around the Angelman Foundation and building uh, the uh, communication series that I've pointed many of you to over the past couple of years. So um, Erin's um, background is that she was a um, union organizer, and I can tell that that's really uh, that's a good skill to bring to this work. She's trans she's a transplanted American who we're hoping gets to stay in Canada because we want to keep her. Erin um, went back to school um, after her daughter Maggie, who you're going to learn a little bit about, was born to uh, learn how to learn more, and she learned lots more about uh, educating uh, and educating well children with Angelmans. Um, recently, I know some of you may have been at the uh, AAC in the Desert with Carolyn Musselwhite and uh, Aaron and Karen from uh, Aaron and Karen Aaron and Carolyn. From what I understand, did a bang up job of giving people wonderful resources for thinking about communication and literacy for kids um, with all kids with Angelmans and other challenges in terms of um, literacy and communication. And mostly, I know Erin is mom to Maggie, who's there in the middle. And I'm going to also give a shout out to Ella or Eileen, who anyone who follows me on Facebook or, or follows Erin knows um, challenged our prime minister in a brilliant fashion when the, he was doing the um, uh, town halls in Kingston. So um, Erin's doing lots of things right. This evening, um, we've invited her not so much to talk about her work with uh, literacy and communication, which I think will probably come into the talk at some level, but because Erin um, has a wonderful message on inclusive education. Um, last summer when I was teaching the AAC course, I had Erin come into the class and uh, Tell the, give this talk, or I think a similar talk, and by far and away it was the best talk I ever heard about inclusive education, still is the best talk I've ever heard, so no pressure, Erin. Um, but we are delighted, and, and really in terms of thinking about AAC and communication, the foundation of everything is having meaningful active participation, um, so uh, which means inclusion. So I'm going to quit talking now because I'm already taking up too much time, and with that, Erin, you're we're very glad you're here, and please um, feel free to begin your talk. Erin, are you muted? We can't hear you, or I can't hear you. Something looks kind of funny, Kath. Give me a second on my end. I don't think she's muted. Erin, are you there? Oh dear. She's not. She's not muted. No, I see that. Take out my headphones. Does it work now? It does now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yep. A little bit quiet, but it is absolutely working. And then, Erin, I'm not sure what happened there, but we lost your screen, so you might have to hit okay. share screen again. I'm sorry. So that was actually the same headphones we used when we did the test, so they seem to have just suddenly stopped. Hmm. Sorry about that. No worries. I'm uh, glad you have a, a spare. That's fabulous. So let me know when you can see my It's screen. back. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to mute too. Okay. Thanks, Erin. So I'm hoping the volume is the um is the sound quality coming through okay? Because I'm not using any yeah. form of headset now. Yeah, Perfect. you'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for that, and sorry about that. Um. So really, all I'm going to do tonight is talk about um our journey with Maggie, um how we came to understand inclusion, um given the context of her diagnosis and everything we were told to expect for her future, and then what that has meant in terms of um, our relationship with Maggie's schools um, and how we've been planned her education and so on. So let's just get started. So here's Maggie um, at six weeks old. She was born dur during the um, big East Coast blackout. I don't know if any of you guys in Alberta experienced that, but um, literally, 
just as she was about to be born at home with a planned home birth, um, the entire east coast of the United States lost power, and uh, we had to try to uh, to get to the hospital. And we knew at that point that this must be a really powerful kid coming into the world if she could uh, short circuit an entire electrical grid. Um, but at about a year old, um, she got a diagnosis of Angelman syndrome. And I knew, I mean, I knew when she was a few weeks old. I remember actually putting all my Dr. Sears baby books away and deciding that I just wasn't going to compare her to babies in books. Um, and the biggest things that she didn't do were she didn't make eye contact and she didn't respond to sound. So at a year old, they believed that she was deaf and blind. Um, and then genetic testing confirmed uh, Angelman syndrome. So she has a really interesting combination of um, that kind of dual sensory feed, uh, sensory issue of low vision, cortical visual impairment, and pretty profound auditory processing impairment. Um, so when Maggie was diagnosed with Angelman, we were told she might never walk, she would never talk, certainly never learn how to read or write, um, probably would never learn how to dress herself or toilet herself or feed herself or be able to protect herself or sleep through the night. And the major message we got from the medical community was that she would never be more than a toddler, that her growth would, would always just be that of a toddler. Um, and we heard that and believed that it meant that therefore she could never have friends. Um, she would never learn. Um, she would never be able to communicate, obviously read or write, um, have dreams and be able to realize them, be able to speak up for herself and make a contribution um, and just live any kind of ordinary life. And that was just a message that was pounded on us from just about every doctor appointment we had. We were told when we got the diagnosis, take her home and love her. Um, and we just really understood from that, don't expect anything from her. When she transitioned from preschool into the school system, we had one of those big meetings with all the therapists um, and the social worker, and we talked about her transition. And I remember just sitting there speechless, staring at this form, because the second, the bottom half of the page went on, there was like four copies of it for everything that they felt that she needed assistance with, and there was nothing that she was listed that she could do well. Um, no strengths, no, no, um, nothing that they or anyone was expecting that she would actually contribute to the classroom. And it just was such a message of this is a child who drains resources but doesn't actually um, contribute anything. Um, her school documents really reinforced that message as well. I mean, every assessment, um, everything we saw just described her with words like severe, profound, everything was pre, pre-communicative, pre-everything. Um, a nine-month age equivalent at um, age four or five, not just in the first percentile. I remember the psychologist making sure we understood she was in the first one-tenth of the first percentile. Um, helpless, needy, consuming, um, medically fragile, and low functioning was a term we heard a lot. It was really clear to us that the vision behind her school plan, if you just looked at her goals, if you looked at what was being written in her IEP and what people were talking about as what they were going to work on with her, was that the number one goal for Maggie, the vision, was that she learned to reduce her burden on others, that that was the primary responsibility she had in school, as though her support needs um, were almost her fault and that that's why we needed to prioritize anything that would reduce her burden. It was very clear from the behavior plans and the conversations, but also even what was written in her goals, was that her job was not to disrupt anyone else's learning. She was going to be allowed to be in the regular classroom, but she was not going to be allowed to in any way disrupt the regular classroom. Um, and she would be removed from the regular classroom either temporarily to walk in the halls um, or 
long term um, if she didn't learn how to not disrupt anyone else's learning. And what we saw fairly quickly was that meant that she wasn't even supposed to vocalize, that her job sitting in group activities in kindergarten, she actually had a wonderful kindergarten teacher and a very loving aide, um, but her job was to sit passively and observe the learning happening around her because if she vocalized or got excited, that was perceived as a problem uh, because all those other kids are here to learn um, and she appeared to be there to observe. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on obedience and compliance and you know, responding to adult requests, responding when prompted. And her assessment was all about giving the correct answer multiple times because we just can't trust that if she got it right the first time that she actually meant it. Um, and there was sort of this vague thing that maybe we'd find something potentially useful she could do. And I remember brainstorming, hearing special educators say, well, she might be able to learn how to water plants. Let's look into that, right, as though that was kind of this option that we might one day get to. And so for us, um, you know, I met my husband on um, the steps of uh, the Seattle jail after he had been arrested in lawful protest, um, the, the class action lawsuit for his arrest and the arrest of 2,000 other people was Hickey versus Seattle, that's named after my husband. So he was arrested after lawful protest. I had been so severely um, tear gassed that I had ended up in the hospital. So. You know, we knew how to organize, we knew how to agitate, um, we knew how to have a vision of what we want society to look like and how to work towards that. Um, and so as we started figuring out what was our vision, what was our vision as a family, what was our vision for Maggie, what I've really started looking into is what predicts what happens to our students after school? What predicts their lives? And feel free to take yourselves off of um, mute and, and chime in here and say, what it is you think predicts life for our students like Maggie, our students with significant disabilities after school? And if you're too shy, I'll just give you what I hear the most often. And if you don't, you can also put it into the chat. And I, I'm monitoring the chat, and Ross is monitoring the chat. So yeah, but take a mic, people. <laughs> Making an uncomfortable silence with an expectant pause, hoping to get a response. Friendships, says Corey. Our expectations, says Toby. I'm getting connections with others. Belonging. Social interaction. Excellent. And then a comment that suggested that getting tear gassed with your husband was very romantic. <laughs> we sent a card to the mayor, Mayor Paul Shell of Seattle, thanking him for in his own backhanded way, arranging for us to meet. Um, so the most common things we hear are a lot of what you guys just said. One of you may have already heard this presentation, but um, <laughs> school placement, right? So for those of us who are um, advocates for school inclusion, we absolutely believe that you know getting inclusive placements for our kids is important. We know the research shows that placements matter. Um, independent functional skills and life skills and just being able to function in a variety of, of contexts and environments. We know that matters. Um, communication ability um, and being able to express ourselves and advocate for ourselves and having appropriate beha behaviors and having friendships. All those things matter. But none of these are actually what predicts life after school because interestingly, and Eric Carter's research is really good here, showing that we can do a lot of things right at school. We can have inclusive placements. We can um, you know, teach kids a lot of skills. They can have really effective behaviors that make them really just easy to be with. They can even have friendships, be friendly with kids at school, and still at 25 find themselves sitting on the couch at their parents' house without a life. And we cannot have a lot of those things in place. We can do a lot of things wrong at school, and they can still have lives out in the community um, after school. And what predicts it, the biggest predictor is actually none of these things. The number one factor is parental expectations. What do parents expect is going to happen and what do parents value? So if parents value friendships and parents expect 
that that's possible, then parents will work tirelessly to make it happen. If parents expect post-secondary education and parents value post-secondary education, then they will work tirelessly to make it happen. There is nothing that predicts life after school, and this actually is particularly strong um, with employment. If parents value employment and believe it's possible for their son or daughter, their son or daughter will be employed after school regardless of things like independent functional skills, communication ability, school placement. Just really fascinating work. And what Carter's work has shown was that our parents' expectations form very early. So think about how Maggie was a year old and we were already being told just take her home and love her. But don't expect anything else, right? Expectations form very early. Our expectations reflect what we know. So if we, as parents, actually have the experience of knowing adults with disabilities, knowing adults with disabilities who have really meaningful lives, or what Carter calls enviable adult lives, um, then our expectations are much higher. But if we ourselves were also educated in segregated settings where we didn't know anyone with disabilities and we don't as adults know anyone with disabilities, um, then our expectations are going to just simply reflect what we know. And we know that experience shapes expectations so that if, if we, you know, take a risk and try that inclusive preschool, and our child is welcomed, and our child is accommodated, and our child has success and develops a sense of belonging, then that experience then shapes our expectations, and we expect to keep finding that, and we keep taking more of those risks to make that happen. And similarly, our expectations shape our experience, so that if we expect that our student will be welcomed and accepted, um, then we're actually going to seek out those experiences and make them happen. But the reverse also works. Experience shapes expectations. If we try it and we feel rejected, if we feel our children are rejected, if we feel our children are not supported, then that shapes our expectations and that shapes the experiences that we look for. So we know that our expectations change based on the opportunities that we're able to provide our students and the support that they are that they're provided and also really that parents are provided, that when parents are supported to have high expectations and to take those risks and our kids are supported, our expectations go up. So there's all these things you can do as teachers, right? But if it's not part of your work to make sure you're raising the expectations of the parents of your students, then a lot of your work is not going to be as powerful as it could be um, unless we're making sure that those interactions that we have um, with families, between families and educators, are actually raising expectations. And a pretty startling part of Eric Carter's work shows that the longer that families interact with the school system, the more years of, of, of interaction we have, the more intense our interaction with the school system, the lower our expectations become. And he calls this realignment. Um, that our, um, the school systems tend to have low expectations for our students, and our expectations end up aligning with school systems over time. So I was really, really fortunate, um, as a political activist anyway, to um, find a program in New York State called Partners in Policymaking. Maggie was very little. So I went to Partners in Policymaking when uh, she was only about 18 months old. And complete fluke, I just happened to get to meet Lou Brown. I was actually assigned to introduce him, so I had to go research him. And I'll tell you, you know, the internet was actually still a bit new 15 years ago, uh, or 14 years ago when I did that. So I looked him up, and everything I found, I remember coming back and, and introducing him as a radical inclusionist. He truly believed that every person can be included. And he challenged me, because at the time that Maggie was diagnosed, I was actually um, since we keep talking about my politics, I was actually working full time on the presidential election of 2004 um, and uh, trying to get the incumbent out and a new person in. And so we were in Missouri. I had taken a position in a swing state so I could try to, um, to work on that election. And in Missouri, in St. Louis, 
they have separate school boards for students with disabilities. And my interpretation of that at the time was, wow, they so value these kids who are so different that they don't just get their own classrooms. They don't just get their own schools. They actually get their own school districts, right? I mean, they must put all the experts, everyone who knows best in this one school board so that there's a separate board for students with disabilities. And so we were trying to decide, well, should we stay in, go back to New York? Should we stay in New York or should we go back to Missouri? And Lou really challenged me, and he said, what is your number one concern when you're thinking about Maggie's future? And she was just a baby at the time. And I said, her safety. She's so vulnerable, given everything they've told us to expect about angel syndrome. Her safety is my biggest concern. And he said, then you need to have her included, because we know from all of the data, all of the research, that safety is found in wide open spaces with people who know Maggie well who have no power over her. And her vulnerability is going to be greatest in separate closed spaces with people who have power over her and no competent witnesses. And I have used this so many times because it was so profound when he told me that and it has such logic that we have repeatedly had to kind of explain ourselves. So why is it again that you want Maggie included in the in school? Why do you, what do you possibly think she can benefit? What she, what can she gain from a regular grade eight classroom or a regular high school classroom? And what it always comes back to is because that's where she's safest. She's safest in wide open spaces, open to the public, with people who know her well, who have no power over her, and that is her peers. And honestly, every really big challenging issue we've had the school system with something that happened over the course of Maggie's school career happened because she was removed to a separate or enclosed space with people who had power over her and no competent witnesses. And an exception was made. They did something that they wouldn't do to students without disabilities because of the nature of her disabilities. And then that became whatever crisis we had to deal with. So that then is my my, the foundation of everything we've done. I did not support school inclusion until Lou Brown described it this way. And if there is nothing else that comes from Maggie's uh, school inclusion, then she is going to be safe because she's learned how to be um, where all the people are. Um, she has many, many relationships with people who know her well, who have no power over her and can speak up for her. And in fact, the most powerful meetings we've had with the school system have been when her classmates um, come into her IEP and planning meetings with us and speak up because so often the perspective of the children is very different from the perspective of the adults and what the Maggie's fellow students have to say um, about what's working and not working has just been incredibly important. So from all that, we were able to develop a vision for Maggie and our expectations for her. Um, I really wanted her to be taught at school. I felt like everything that we were working on, the school system was willing to have her be included in the regular classroom, but it felt like she was always going to be an observer. It felt like the phrase that I heard the most was that she would be exposed. <laughs> she'd be exposed to the curriculum. She'd be exposed to the lessons. She'd be exposed to the activities. But it felt like she would be sitting there watching them um, rather than cognitively engaged. I wanted to know that she was teaching. I mean, my grandmother was a professor of education. My entire family is teachers. I wanted to know she was going to be taught. And I wanted her to be taught in that regular education classroom. Um, Maggie's made it very clear to us, she's a teenager now, and she has no intention of living with us um, once she's an adult. Her very best times are when she's got a very obnoxious and noisy um, set of friends over, and they're in her bedroom, and I'm sure there's all kinds of things happening on social media and everything else that I wouldn't approve of, um, but it's what they do and what she has fun. Uh, we made a vision for self-employment in a job she loves. I don't think that she's a kid who's going to fit into traditional employment, but um, we have a whole employment plan, and now that she's in high school, that's actually become the focus of all of her high school planning. I want her to develop passions and interests and hobbies and therefore you know, be out in public pursuing these along with all the other people, and you'll see her employment 
um, one of her favorite things since she's been very little is going to real estate open houses. She just really likes seeing other people's houses. And the funny thing is now that she's a teenager, it turns out that a whole bunch of teenagers really like to do that. Um, so that's been hilarious to find out that it's now completely age appropriate to go and visit real estate open houses. Um, I want her to learn what her own unique contribution is and learn how to make it and, and make it. Um, and for her to be confident that when she's in a space, she's making it better because she's there. And to learn the autonomy and self-discipline, um, to really be in control of her own body and her own self rather than obedience, because I don't think she can afford to be obedient. Um, she can't afford to learn that if a person has authority um, or just because they wear a scrub top that they can tell her to get undressed or that, that anyone can just tell her what to do. Um, and so, you know, this obviously led to lots of discussion about, with school and going back to those IEP goals that really did not share that vision. Um, what was school preparing Maggie for? What were those IEP goals preparing her for? Was she being prepared to live an ordinary life or was she being prepared to live what I would call a disabled life? Um, because, you know, a highly obedient, um, passive observer um, is not going to be able to live an ordinary life. So these are just some of Maggie's BFFs and some of the activities that she does just with her friends. Middle school has obviously been its own adventure, but now we're moving on to high school. So this is an ordinary life, right? This is hanging out with friends and family and traveling and just getting out to be part of the world. This is Maggie's first duck face selfie. This is one of her self-portraits. I just love that she's quite a photographer. And this is our um, our vision for her employment is if you go to a lot of real estate open houses, you will find, especially in our neighborhood, that there are a whole bunch of houses that sit vacant for a long time. So the house was maybe last decorated in 1972. Um, there's an elderly couple living there. One of them passes away. One ends up in a nursing home, and the house sits vacant until the kids in Toronto can figure out what to do with it. And when those houses then go on the market, they're very musty. They're very dated. There's snow all over the porch and leaves, and they just don't feel clean, and they take a really long time to sell. And so our business plan for Maggie, um, her friends at school have already named it. It's called Totally Mag Home Staging. Um, and we're thinking that maybe, we don't know, but maybe run it as a not-for-profit, um, as a service to uh, seniors and anyone who's low income to come in and do their home staging. And that means getting all the snow off the porch or the leaves or just making everything polished, maybe putting out some annuals, polishing the glass, sweeping the floor, opening the windows, airing the house out, maybe warming it up if it's in winter, or cooling it down if it's in summer, but doing that whole part because we can really see that Maggie is so eager to get into people's houses and just spend that time in them. She can spend an hour just walking around a house, admiring everything about it, checking out every nook and cranny, and then doing the work, um, doing the work to get that house ready and, uh, and get that sold. Um, to, to figure out this vision, to find a vision for Maggie and then be able to communicate it to the school, um, we really had to find the tools to help us do that. And for us, um, person-centered planning tools have just been essential. So when she was young, we did something called essential lifestyle planning. And as she's gotten older, we work with Helen Sanderson and Associates who do person-centered planning here in Canada. Um, and this is Maggie's one-page profile. So one of our kind of rules with the school system is that before anyone works with Maggie and can read anything about her supply notes or her care plan um, or her IEP, they need to first read her one-page profile. And this has been put together with input from lots of friends and lots of educators. Um, but just talking about how much fun she used to be with us, you know, all the things we most like and admire about her. She's so fun. She's optimistic. She's cheerful. She's incredibly self-confident. She's incredibly authentic um, and very persistent. She's resourceful, um, and she has wicked skills on an iPad. 
What's really important to Maggie um, is being with her friends and family, being in control of her own body, um, including being able to move around, always having her iPads, always having many choices, including the option none of these. So never make her choose between two because if you don't also give her the option of none of these, then she won't even look at it. Um, not having to prove herself or repeat herself. And then really learning how you can best support Maggie. And this actually isn't her most um, recent one-page profile. Her more recent, we've gotten a lot more specific um, about how to support her so that she can look and listen um, because she can't really do those simultaneously, but how, how to make sure that she can understand what you're saying and how to make sure you're giving her the time uh, to process language and be able to respond back. And this tool in particular, this is called From Presence to Contribution. It's a tool from Helen Sanderson and Associates. But where it's been the most important or the most valuable to us is sometimes when we're talking about inclusion, everybody thinks that they already know what it is. Um, so whether we're talking about inclusion when she's brand new to her middle school or now brand new to her high school, um, everyone thinks they know what inclusion is and they have their own idea of what it is and what it means. And sometimes it's like we're talking on different channels because we're just not hearing and not understanding because we're talking about something different. With presence to contribution, it becomes really clear. So presence means, you, it, physical presence means you're there. You're physically there, you're physically in the space. And we all have experience with inclusion that is physical presence um, without any other form of presence. Having presence means, yes, you're physically there, but other people know you're there. They're responding to you and you're responding to them. So there's just that you have presence, you are known in the space. Actively participating means that whatever the activity is, you're part of it. And so for our students with complex needs, we've done the problem solving to make sure that they can participate um, in what's happening, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's the activity. Connecting means that while you're participating, you're making that social connection with other people. You're not just participating in something, just you yourself as an individual, but you're really part of um, a group experience and you're having a social connection with other people. And contributing means we can talk about how it was better because you were part of it. Um, the, to me, that's what contribution is all about. And I'll give you some more specifics about kind of what that looks like. I think of it as going to, like, I don't actually watch hockey, but if I went to hockey, being present means just sitting in the stands. Having presence means other people see you. You know, you have to wiggle out of the way so they can walk past you and you're jostling others and so you're there, right? You're seen, you're not invisible. Actively participating means you're all watching the game. Connecting means that when your side scores, you're like cheering and high-fiving with the people around you. Um, and contributing means the game was more fun to watch because you were there. So, what we kept discovering was that kind of the biggest issues we were having um, with Maggie's inclusion, the reason that she was in such a passive observer role was really because she was not imagined as potentially literate. Um, whatever activity they were doing, um, they would adapt it to Maggie like, we're going to learn about pioneers. Can Maggie learn to point to a picture of a pioneer and point to a picture of herself? Can she learn to point to a wagon that a pioneer rode in and point to her van? Um, there was no sense that in school, we send kids to school really to learn how to read and write before anything else. Um, we teach kids about the world while teaching them how to read and write and speak and communicate. And then once they've learned how to read and write, we keep developing those skills while we learn about the world. And so how do we use the general education curriculum to develop Maggie's literacy skills? How do we do that um, still learning to read phase, learning to read while learning about the world phase that all kids have at, say, grade one? And how do we extend that all across the school career? Um, for Maggie, as I learned more about literacy instruction, I thought, you know, I don't have any expectation that they're going to teach Maggie how to read this year. 
what if it takes 50 years? Let's say that it's going to take 50 years for Maggie to learn how to read and write. What does a 50-year literacy plan look like? And I presented that to her school and said, you know, I actually wrote out what I thought a 50-year literacy plan looked like and said, you're only responsible for your one year. Don't think that you have to, you know, that, that we're expecting that she's going to be reading and writing at the end of the school year. But you have to make sure that you at least provide her the opportunities and the instruction that's part of that year one that we're in. Um, and so, so I believe this has just become really, really obvious to me that so long as we believe that a student is not potentially literate, um, we're never going to be able to actually include them in the classroom. And inclusion means that we're going to differentiate the activities, we're going to provide multiple access points, whatever the instruction that we're providing, whatever the activities that we're doing and the instructional activities, however we're assessing students, we're going to differentiate all that. We're going to create lots of access points to make sure that our students can actually access the instruction we're providing. But we're not differentiating the curriculum. Inclusion means that all of our kids are learning the curriculum. They're learning the general curriculum, the regular curriculum. They're learning what matters. They're learning about things like citizenship and what it means to be a Canadian as opposed to being from any other country and how Canada interacts with the world. They're learning about science um, and what natural laws, how natural laws kind of influence humans and how humans influence the planet and all of that. But we're not changing the curriculum just because of the student's disability. And there's a whole bunch of tools which I won't get into, um, but the first time I saw this um, early literacy um, rubric, so this is Kathy Stogler's literacy rubric, and it's really just breaking down kind of the earliest steps of um, reading. The first time I saw this, I burst into tears because at least within an Ontario context, because we're here in Ontario, there was no sense of this. When we pushed for literacy instruction for Maggie, the assumption was this student has significant disabilities and as far as we know, knows nothing about literacy, so the first thing we're going to do is teach her to recognize the letters. And as soon as she can identify letters in the alphabet, then we'll know that she's ready for more literacy instruction. And that was just... I've just seen this as a really common pattern with a lot of our families. And what this showed me is these are the steps that typical kids go through in the areas of phonemic awareness, concepts of print, word recognition, fluency, comprehension. These, this is the development we see in typically developing children from the time they're infants all the way until they start, um, and, until they're in kindergarten. That we don't take typically developing really young children and go, we're going to teach you to recognize your letters. And as soon as you can accurately identify nine out of ten letters, we're going to start working on 15. We don't do that. Here's all of the things we do with typical kids and all of the skills typical kids develop before we even get into alphabet instruction. And this became really powerful because the first time we did it with Maggie, she had three out of 25 areas that she had some early emerging skills in. This was the first time that we saw a road to literacy. This was the first time that um, up until then it was could she even be on the same road as the other kids that she was considered so different, she must be completely somewhere else. Um, whereas this showed me the path um, that if we just looked at um, emerging literacy skills, we could really see. And you can see over two years, so the first time we filled this out was 2012, the next time was 2014, um, we could see real growth and development in a way that so long as we were focusing on things like you know, point to this letter, point to that letter. We just weren't seeing that growth and development. Um, since 2014, I would say we haven't seen um, as significant um, growth throughout the rubric. It'd be interesting to read to um, fill this out again. Uh, we haven't done it yet this school year. Um, but what we've really done is consolidate where she's at and really consolidate uh, her receptive language development. 
And then when I really found the tool that was the most useful to the bridge. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, just Google it. Um, Patsy Pierce developed this. Um, so it is an observational portfolio assessment tool. You can download it from the Center for Literacy and Disabilities website. If you just Google CLDS um, UNC, you'll, uh, this is the first thing that pops up, and you can check out the bridge um, protocol. So this was a tool they developed um, in North Carolina to assess the literacy readiness of typically developing preschoolers within, well, actually with and without disabilities. Um, but what it has done is just give us a lot of information about how literacy develops in typical kids and therefore how we can see it in, um, in our kids, how we can see it developing in our kids. And so we have these uh, scales to be able to check out. And what I found with the bridge, um, Karen Erickson is the director of the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies. Uh, Patsy Pierce is the one who developed this. They've seen kind of what I've been playing around with it, which is modifying and adapting the bridge. It's still just a draft version, but um, figuring out for our students with the more complex disabilities, um, kind of there's a, a larger range of things. We need more items on each scale because there were things on the bridge, for example, um, if you look at item three, how does blank, the student can engage in the act of reading, it asks, does the student point, label, comment, or act out story characteristics during, during joint reading? I mean, that's four separate skills in one item. And with our students, with our more complex kids, we're not going to, if we keep all four of those in one item, we're not going to be able to, to capture that. So I've been stretching them out, um, introducing some even earlier starting points and, um, and so on. And I'm happy to share this as long as you know it's just completely a draft and I'm really looking for feedback. But where we work with, with um, families and school teams is figure this out, figure out where the student is at. Are they, what are they doing with books? Do they know that books have pages? Do they know that books exist? Are they interacting with books? Are they stacking them and banging them? Have they learned that books are different from blocks? Or have they learned that books have pages and we have specific behaviors that we do with books, such as turning the pages and looking at what's on the page? You know, how do they respond to being read to? Are they really studying the book pages? And how does this change based on the technology? So if it's a paper book or a cardboard book, are the students' behaviors with that book very different than if, for example, it's an iPad book or if it's a book that's on a computer screen and we're advancing the pages by clicking them out? And we often see very different behaviors that way. But then just kind of taking an inventory, um, knowing what to be looking for to observe and making sure that we're providing the opportunities. I mean, one of the first things that a lot of us do when we see this stuff is realize, oh, if ripping and mouthing books and paper is actually a first stage, I need to get the books out and I need to make them available so my kid can touch them and explore them um, because I've protected them. I've put the books up because I'm waiting for him to be ready to, um, to actually be able to handle them, that kind of thing. So that's where I find these uh, scales so helpful to help us figure out what are the opportunities that we might not even be providing um, and how can we do that. So I'll share this. Um, Kathy, I'll just email the latest version to you if anybody wants. I think um, I already have it, Erin, from the AIDS okay. Desert because I used it last week with a district. And um, so I think that would be great. But I'd also going to challenge people a little bit. If you are using it because it is a draft, it would be really valuable for us to collect some information and give it back to Erin. Fair enough, Erin? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very much it. It needs to become a lot more concise. Um, and I don't recommend making a goal for each item. So for example, I just did um, the bridge with a student um, the other day. And what we saw was that in most areas, such as how the student interacted with books and handled books, he was towards the end of the scale. He had really good skills there. But he wasn't taking any ownership of literacy experience. He wasn't really commenting on the on books on while being read to. He wasn't going out of his way to read. He wasn't he enjoyed being read to, but he wasn't initiating stories. And so out of these five items that all involve early reading, we just picked that one to make as the goal to 
him initiating and commenting and really taking ownership of the literacy experience. So this will continue to change over time. Um, and I think I want to say, yeah. kind of challenge a little bit the group here. If you're generous enough to share your work, I think we could be gener enough, generous enough to actually give you some feedback. Um, so anyway, so I, okay, perfect. <laughs> So all of this meaning, it's not inclusion if we're not including our kids in the instruction. If we're teaching all the other kids how to read and write, we need to be doing that with our kids, read and write and talk. It's not inclusion if we're not including the students in the big ideas. So if we're studying pioneer society, why do we study that? Why do we think it's important for Canadian students to learn about pioneer society or um, uh, I'm already blanking what they called the, uh, Maggie was learning last year about um, the early French Canada. Why does that matter? Why do we teach kids about the butterfly life cycle? Why do we teach them about the Canadian shield? There's a reason. What's that big idea? And we really need to have cognitive clarity around what that big idea is. And we need to make sure we're including the students in that. Because if we're reducing their instruction to point to the mountain, point to the river, then chances are we've actually not included them in the big ideas for why this really matters. Um, it's not inclusion if we don't notice that our student can't participate in what we're asking all the students to do. And sometimes I feel like it's the elephant in the room. Um, nobody wants the student with disabilities to stand out by pointing out the fact that here we are, we've got all these first graders sitting around in a morning meeting, and there's um, a reading message. They're all reading together off of the same sheet. They're doing a choral reading, and our student can't participate. And heaven forbid we actually point that out and problem solve it. But look at what we're doing. If we don't, then we're teaching that student, your job is to sit there and watch all the other kids read. We're teaching all the students in that class. That student is only here to watch you read. They're not actually here to be part of it. Um, if we don't know how art that student can participate in what we're asking all the students to do, then that's not our own individual problem. Let's make that a group problem because it's only inclusion if we're building a community around the student, if we're building a community that can support the student. So let's ask the kids, how can Maggie participate in this activity? Does anybody have ideas? And let's make that our shared challenge to say, we're going to include her in this instruction and we're going to together problem solve how to do it. Um, it's not inclusion if we haven't provided a means for that student to participate, if we haven't provided the assistive technology for them to be able to participate. Um, it's not inclusion if we don't think that they're potentially literate and can develop um, the communication skills to be part of it. Um, it's not inclusion if we haven't actively removed the barriers to them being able to develop those literacy skills, you know, finding the technology, finding the accessible text. Um, and it's not inclusion if we don't do it to students without disabilities, if we're doing something to our kids with disabilities that we don't do and know we shouldn't do um, to kids without disabilities, then it's not inclusion if we do it to our kids. And by that, I mean everything from just the reductionist way that we so often teach our kids, which is just pointing to the answer, um, you know, point to the pioneer wagon, point to the pioneer. If we wouldn't consider that, um, quality assessment for the rest of the kids, then it probably isn't for that student either. So as we think about things like presence to contribution, you know, presence is being physically in the classroom during instruction, which means you have to be there, right? When, when instruction is happening, you can't just be there for specials like, you know, music and lunchtime. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to make a contribution if you're not there. Having presence means you're observing the instruction. Um, you're sitting in the circle. This is um, actually like cheat sheet I made for Maggie's uh, teacher several years ago to, so that we could have conversations in an IEP meeting about whether Maggie was simply physically present or had presence or was actively participating or was connecting or was contributing, right? If Maggie's actually participating in activities, if she's accessing the instruction, if she's being read to, um, when everyone's reading, if she's writing, if she's being expected to participate, if she has access to the same tools and additional tools because she has so many more barriers, then she's participating. 
Um, and is she interacting with her classmates during all this and not just sitting with an educational assistant? Then she's connecting. And contributing means we can talk about how it was better because she was there, right? That whatever that unique contribution is. Um, and sometimes it's just how joyful Maggie is. That that's that's the contribution. Sometimes it's her assistive technology. Um, in her classroom this year, between my two kids, they have, I think, nine or ten Syrian refugees who are their classmates because our community is hosting a lot of, of Syrian refugees. And her technology, Maggie's assistive technology, has become an incredible contribution to this influx of English language learners. And all those visual supports of Maggie's have been really priceless to her classmates. Um, and so we have to problem solve those barriers, right? We have to problem solve the barrier of removing kids from the classroom. We need to problem solve the barrier of when we have this little mini classroom happening between an educational assistant or a therapist or a special educator happening in the corner while the rest of instruction is happening with the classroom teacher. I mean, something I've become really sensitive to is how often our students with disabilities are in the classroom and are receiving the explicit message, oh, don't listen to Mrs. Johnson, just listen to me. Right? Don't, where other adults are redirecting our students' attention to themselves rather than to the classroom teacher. And we're teaching our kids that classroom teacher isn't your teacher. It's everybody else's teacher. You're just supposed to listen to me. So how do we teach all of the adults to support the students' attention um, to recognize the classroom teacher? as their teacher. You know, we need to really problem solve that barrier of our, our educators not having the time and the support and the materials um, to plan that kind of instructional act. Um, we need to make sure our kids have proximity to their peers um, so that they're within arm's reach. Again, Eric Carter has some amazing research, very, very specific research about how rarely our students um, are within proximity um, both to their classmates um, as well as to their AAC system um, and their peers having that kind of uh, proximity to the student's AAC system to even learn how to communicate with them. And when it comes to contribution, the biggest barrier is really lack of imagination, lack of engagement and, and expectation. That we need to figure out that vision, those high expectations for all of our students, and then they have to get shared with our school teams in a way that our school teams can understand how this is possible. Um, share, begin to share in that vision, understand that vision, and really support it so that we can, we can really talk about um, how to make sure all of our kids are contributing. So, and I can share this as a one-page handout as well, just from, from Helen Sanderson. So, um, to start wrapping up, um, the, one of the most important messages, BAT, be assistive technology, not special education. My entire experience with special education has been about how our kids are perceived as so different that we need to do a whole bunch of things different and we're going to really put a lot of energy into measuring how different they are and then measuring if they're becoming any less different. Whereas the field of assistive technology to me has been so much more about how do we create access? How do we build a ramp? Where is the student access point? What technology do they need? What human resource support do they need to be able to, to have access? Um, I'll throw this out there. I don't have a slide for it, but um, if you're trying to think about the difference between AT and spec ed, there's two curriculums that have been developed recently. Um, Boardmaker's instructional solutions are completely based on general education instruction and, and providing um, that access to the regular curriculum. So Boardmaker Instructional Solutions, there's some fabulous stuff, scripted lessons, lesson plans, monthly plans, daily plans, um, to really help teachers give you that, have that time um, and the resources and the materials to be able to just jump in and really provide access to kids. And Don Johnston has a new, um, I have no financial relationship with either of these, Don Johnston has a new uh, curriculum coming out called Readtopia, which takes all their classic literature that they already have in the start to finish library 
um, which, you know, the classic literature that all kids read that's already being rewritten for start to finish at a grade two or grade three reading level and is now making it accessible to the most emergent students with really age-neutral, age-respectful, um, adapted texts going all the way to the earliest levels of literacy um, with kind of almost a graphic novel kind of format. So we're, it's really exciting to be at a time when we're getting two, uh, where there's now two formal curriculums that are really, really age-neutral, um, respectful of our kids, and have that AP focus, rather than the, what is the completely separate special education curriculum we're going to use. Um, as we're thinking about our kids, don't just ask what that student needs, but ask who needs them, who needs Maggie, who needs all of our sons and daughters. This is a picture from Maggie's grade six classroom. And because it's in Maggie's IEP that she has to have visual support because she's very, even though she's low vision, she's very visual. Um, it's much easier for her to process things visually than to process uh, language auditorily. So because of that, her classroom had the highest rate of kids with IEPs. It had a 40% IEP rate and yet was one of the most quiet and disciplined classes in the building because her teacher had so many visual supports, and you can see the whiteboard. She kept literally just a, a dollar store whiteboard with a whiteboard marker under a document camera at the front of the class and just provided those visuals for every instruction she gave the kids. If she was reading a book, she had the book under the document camera and was uh, using her finger to, to follow along. Every kid had those visuals. Maggie always has an iPad mounted in front of her, so whatever is happening can be recorded, whatever is happening in the classroom, or can be magnified so that she can see it. Because she can't see across the room, but she can see as far as her iPad screen. So anything that's happening can be broadcast. And because of Maggie's auditory processing issues, um, her classroom teacher had to use a voice amplifier, which we found enhanced the attention of all of the kids who are otherwise struggling. So. That's just one contribution Maggie made to her class, but ask who needs Maggie? Who needs to be in a classroom with Maggie? Um, these days we ask a lot, who are the English language learners who need to be in a classroom with Maggie? Because everything we're doing with Maggie is actually really supportive of those kids too. Everything I see is that the world needs Maggie. It's been very clear to me that middle school needs Maggie. Middle school has needed really authentic, joyful girls um, to help change that culture. Um, I saw a very mean culture in my own middle school, and I've seen a very mean culture, mean girl culture in Maggie's middle school. And over and over and over again, we see that there are so many girls who need Maggie, who need her honesty, who need her acceptance, um, who need her authenticity, and that permission to be children for a little while longer, um, rather than this pressure to act 25 when you're 14. Maggie makes enormous contributions. Um, I've written an entire book chapter about it. It got published and everything. Um, whether it's from how she accepts help how she requests help or how she declines help. Um, just her irreverence, her buoyancy, her resilience, her self-acceptance. Um, she's a kid who regularly sort of breaks those little social norm rules. Um, she's incredibly uninhibited and she's very honest. Uh, she is a nonviolent protester, but she protests. Um, and all of these things have just been so important. It's really been interesting to me throughout Maggie's whole life to see how it's not you, it's, it's you, not her. If one of her friends is really moody or mean-spirited or just doing something, Maggie has a way of watching and observing without assuming it's about herself and that it's any reflection on her. And I'm just fascinated by that and want to make sure that we really preserve it because for goodness sake, if you spend any time on social media, you know we all need to learn how to understand that someone else's behavior is about them and not us and not take it personally. Um, and the most important message for me is just that 
Maggie is included because her classmates need her there because she is preparing all of them for life. Um, Robert Saylor and Saylor and uh, Arnaldo Rios are two examples, two out of far too many, of what happens to a society where everyone else was educated in a segregated environment and did not learn um, how to interpret and be with and understand and support people with a developmental disability. Robert Saylor died after attending a movie at a movie theater. He wanted to stay and watch his second viewing. His support worker didn't have enough money to buy um, a, a, a second movie ticket to be able to stay. Um, she was trying to contact his mother to get more money. Um, the theater manager, the theater employees, and the mall security had no way to understand him other than he must be a criminal because he wants to stay and he's refusing to leave a movie theater and they actually, um, he died in police custody from the way that they restrained him. Um, had they been educated with Maggie, they would have had a framework to understand challenging behavior as something other than that. Um, Arnaldo Rios, this is the infamous example in Florida where his black caregiver was shot by police. Arnaldo was a large Hispanic man holding a toy truck who became, um, he was perceived as really aggressive and threatening. He was upset about something. He was holding his truck to comfort himself. He was upset about something. His support worker was with him. But members of the general public um, who had been educated in segregated environments and did not have any other way of viewing someone with a developmental disability not only perceived him as a threat, but assumed that his truck was actually a gun, called the police and said there was essentially an angry Hispanic man with a gun. The police came and they were aiming for Arnaldo and they actually shot his caregiver. These are the worst case examples of what happens when we have a segregated society and we're not learning how to support each other. Um, but there's many others. Whatever Maggie's classmates go on to do, whether they be become prime minister or mayor or go to work in a movie theater or become journalists or professors or employers or therapists or teachers or principals or supervisors, they will do that job different because they were educated with Maggie. If one of them goes on one day to become a doctor and has to give a diagnosis like Angelman syndrome, I believe they will give it differently because they were educated with Maggie. Because instead of making all those assumptions that they make, that we all make if we've never known someone with a disability, they'll have a different frame of reference. So Maggie is included because all these people need to learn how to do their jobs better in order to build the society that we know we can build. And we'll do it different because our kids are included. We'll do those jobs different. And we're all aging. We're all going to have diseases. We are all going to have accidents. Some of us are going to develop Alzheimer's. Some of us will develop depression. We're going to have a whole bunch of different life experiences. Maggie's classmates will go on to have so many different uh, roles that they'll fill. They'll become grandparents. They'll be lovers. They'll be partners. They'll be spouses. They'll be parents. Their experience of life will be different because they were included with Maggie. If one of Maggie's classmates is sat down one day and told we're sorry, but your child has a significant disability. They will have a different frame of reference than I had if they were educated alongside students with disabilities. If they're a school principal and they're told you have a student coming with significant disabilities, they'll have a different frame of reference. Um, if their lover or partner or spouse experiences an accident or Alzheimer's, develops dementia, any kind of cognitive decline, they'll have a different frame of reference for what that means and how it's going to impact life than if they never did, if they never had any kind of exposure to it. And so how we support Maggie and students like her in the regular classroom is also how we're teaching all those other kids the meaning of disability, the meaning of cognitive disability, the meaning of infirmity, and the meaning of health. Because we're only going to have a society that we all want to live and age in if we can change how people understand help. And if from the time kids are in kindergarten, if they're learning that help is something that each one of us deserves for our own inherent dignity and that we each have the right to, to direct the help that we get, so that we each have the right to reject 
help that we're offered. And we each have the right to request help on our own terms because we are so valued, because we are being helped so that we can participate with everyone else. If we all learn that help means that from the time that we're in kindergarten, then imagine how we are going to experience and understand and perceive a need for help when we're 90 years old, when we're 80 years old, after a major car accident, in the wake of a disease. We can change this because a few years ago, oops, a few years ago, Canadians were surveyed about under what conditions they would consider assisted suicide. And women with children had the highest rate of saying they would consider assisted suicide if it meant that their children would have to care for them. Because women with children were that afraid of ever becoming a burden on their children. We have created a society, we currently live in a society where help, where, where personal needs, personal care is so shameful, where requiring help is such a source of shame that we think our children and grandchildren are better off with us dead than helping us, than caring for us. And to me, this is what inclusion means, is that we're going to teach a new curriculum about what that means. That instead of thinking of help as something that's an act of charity, it's an act of solidarity, because we so value your contribution that we'll do whatever it takes to enable that contribution. So I'm going to skip through some of this stuff because I think we've just gone on to the slides. Kathy? We can't see your slides right now. Can you oh, you can't? You probably have to hit share screen again. It dropped off for some reason, so. Oh, that's all right. But if you hit um, it, it'll come back. OK. Hold on. While you're doing that, I just want to say I've heard you give this talk before, but my hair is standing up on the back of my neck again. So anyway, continue on, my dear. All right. Well, we're almost done. Um, so just know this. If you're a parent, just know the world needs our sons and daughters. It needs them as they are, exactly as they are. The world needs to learn how to support them because it will make the world a better place. If you're a teacher, trust that you don't have to fix your students. Trust that they have a contribution to make exactly as they are, that our job as educators is to create that opportunity. Make sure that they're having access to opportunity and to experience and to access to creating a community that can support them so that they can, in turn, um, make the change that I think we can make in our society. Because inclusion isn't about making space in what we're already doing for the person with disabilities. It's not a game of musical chairs where we just need to add a wheelchair into the mix. Um, it's not about asking how to solve the problem of including that person with disabilities. That's not what inclusion is. Inclusion is about realizing that the problem is that the absence is that our neighbors with disabilities haven't been there. Our sons and daughters with disabilities haven't been there. And therefore, we don't even know what contribution they can make. Inclusion is about removing that absence. It's about realizing that the absence of people with disabilities is the problem. And what we're doing is trying to correct that problem by learning how to create a society that includes our folks. So it's about improving what we're doing by including all people, and making sure that each person's contribution is visible so it can be valued and acknowledged. And that's it. You don't have to. I always end all my presentations with this because I know it can be a lot. <laughs> it can feel overwhelming. But you don't have to do everything at once. But just if it's a 50-year plan, just figure out the first step. Just figure out what it is we need to do right now just to take that first step. OK, and that's it, Kathy. Brava, my darling, brava. I, yeah, I, 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 as I said, when, when I hear her talk, I, I kind of get a little bit, um, no, um, I get emotional, actually. And the, But tonight, the thing, Erin, that popped up for me, and maybe I'll let other people um, think about what might have popped up for them, but tonight what popped up for me in a way that I hadn't quite thought about it before, although I talked about my high school yearbook being vanilla <laughs> um, is that I 
I was educated in a segregated classroom. I was segregated from other people from whom I could have learned, from whom I could have um, gained a rich in my understanding of humanity, from from who I could have gained things that Maggie has is teaching her friends. My kids have been segregated from the kids that I've worked with for most of my life. And while I give them, I gave them intermittent um, uh, exposure and uh, intermittent participation, it was not an inclusive environment. Um, so I think you've given, uh, well, you've given me, as you always do, much to think about. And I hope you've given all of us who are most concerned about kids whose voices are often silenced, whose participation is often limited or um, <laughs> only given through their proving that they are worthy, um, much to think about and take away and chew on. So I see lots of people saying thank you. Um, again, Erin, magnificent. Um, I'm going to stop for a minute and see if there's anyone else that wants to take the mic and ask a question.